as per usual, I have no disclosures. So today we're going to review the patient outcomes following evaluation for breast abscess in the emergency department and review the not uncommon clinical and imaging presentations of breast emergencies that occur after hours in the emergency department. So just a little background, subspecialty breast imaging divisions deal with daily screening exams, diagnostic imaging, and non-emergent procedures, but more often than not, do not have after-hour emergency services. However, there are breast emergencies that present in the ED, which require immediate imaging. This leaves many acute breast problems imaged and interpreted by the emergency department radiologists. So this presentation will illustrate examples of acute inflammatory conditions, abscess formation, and post-surgical complications that are often seen in the ER. ERs can have anywhere from 5 to 10 patients a week presenting with the complaint involving the breast. So at the University of Michigan, from January 2009 to July 2013, there were 519 rule-out abscess ultrasounds referred to us from the ED. A whopping 36%, 185, were performed after hours. And these were interpreted by the ED radiologist, our residents giving prelim reads, and our on-call ultrasound faculty. And some of the ED diagnoses that will be seen are mastitis and abscess, post-op complications, trauma, and inflammatory breast cancer is always our concern. Today we will not be using the topic trauma, as it often is something that we see maybe on a more delayed situation for fat necrosis. So with the first line of imaging would typically be during the day is mammography, but after hours, that's highly unlikely to happen. So often the first line will be ultrasound, and that'll be the modality used. But the big question is, are these ultrasound techs trained in breast imaging? Usually not. Usually the cross-sectional ultrasound techs who are not trained are the ones performing this ultrasound. And how much post-scanning gets done? Our ED radiologists are extremely busy and often do not have the time to go back and do some post-scanning. And do we all know the proper follow-up recommendations? So result communication is inc incredibly important in this talk and in, in the ED. Almost all conditions should have a follow-up in a dedicated breast imaging department or with a breast surgeon. And the results and recommendations should be communicated directly to the ordering physician and the communication should be documented in the final report. Why is this so important? Although litigation in the area of imaging has decreased since the introduction of MQSA, the failure to diagnose or delay in diagnosis of breast cancer is still quite high. The failure to communicate information can also be the source of lawsuits. There's also a heightened awareness of breast cancer in our community and in the public eye. Therefore, there is a strong sense of urgency. So at Michigan, of those 36%, 185 scans that were performed after hours, we had 44% diagnosed with an abscess. A quarter of those were recently post-op, and 12% were postpartum complicated mastitis. The remaining 56% were diagnosed with mastitis, and only one out of the 185 had an associated known malignancy. Of those, 143 out of 185 had clinical or imaging follow-up. 23% did not have follow-up. I know that sounds like we're missing out on the follow-up, but there's very little literature regarding the acceptable rate of follow-up from breast complaints. When ED studies looked at outpatient clinical follow-up, they report a compliance rate of 28 to 65%. So we can compare those numbers to our numbers and can be pretty proud of the 77%, although you can also look at it as if we're missing 23% of those patients who are not having follow-up. So mastitis and abscesses will present with an inflamed, indurated red breast. They often have fever and flu-like symptoms and could have a palpable lump. These patients are very, very sick. Typically, 
there's lactating females who are usually less than 40 and mastitis has a prevalence of 30% of lactating women and it's typically peripheral. Postpartum mastitis is a localized cellulitis caused by bacterial invasion through an irritated or fissured nipple. It typically occurs after the second postpartum week and may be precipitated by milk stasis. There's usually a history of a cracked nipple or skin abrasion. Staph aureus is the most common organism responsible, but staph epidermis and streptococci are occasionally isolated. Ultrasound findings are typically skin thickening greater than 3 millimeters, subcutaneous edema, they're extremely tender to touch, even with a transducer, and what we're trying to do is evaluate for discrete fluid collection or a solid mass. Here's an example of what a postpartum mastitis looks like. Here's three weeks postpartum. Um, she has a history of a red swollen breast. On an ultrasound here, you can see that, that she's got skin thickening of approximately four to five millimeters, and we've got fluid interdigitated between the breast tissue, but we don't have a focal fluid collection. This is typically what the edema looks like in the subcutaneous tissues. So our impression and report would be findings consistent with probable mastitis, no evidence of abscess. Recommend appropriate follow-up with breast imaging after treatment to ensure resolution. Patient was placed on a 10-day course of antibiotics, referred to a breast surgeon, and follow-up was recreated for diagnostic breast imaging. So abscess, the ultrasound findings, typically look like a complicated fluid collection and can be hypoechoic to isoechoic. Isoechoic are the more difficult diagnoses, and that is one reason why a dedicated breast ultrasound or breast imager has better sense of an isoechoic fluid collection versus looking at stagnant images in the ED. They're typically irregularly shaped, and they have a positive gel sign. Even when you put the gel on, they're ready to just jump off the table. Here's a 65-year-old woman who had a post mastectomy. So this is a post-surgical complication in which you can see that she has a hypoechoic complicated fluid collection. This measured six centimeters. The impression recommendation was suspicious for abscess. Therefore, the patient was referred to a breast surgeon and was referred for follow-up and breast imaging. Placing a drain was considered, given that this was greater than 3 centimeters by 3 centimeters, although the surgeon opted to take her to the OR to reduce the abscess. In our non-lactating females, they more commonly have central, periolar, or subareolar abscesses, which is active inflammation around non-dilated or subareolar breast ducts versus periductal mastitis. There is some evidence that smoking does increase your risk. Peripheral abscesses are less common in the non-lactating patient and associated with also smoking, post-op, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, steroid treatment, and there's a rare granulomatous lobular mastitis that can occur peripherally and maybe post-trauma. So a recurrent subareolar breast abscess, they are uncommon, and they are linked to something called squamous metaplasia of terminal lactiferous ducts. Something coined as SMOLD, squamous metaplasia of lactiferous ducts. They often need surgical excision of the affected ducts. Bland and Copeland propose a pathological evolution of the normal breast, hypothesizing that smoking leads to the periductal inflammation. So the first insult to the normal breast tissue is inflammation caused by possibly hormonal factors, smoking, or something anatomical. And this is the point where one may or may not progress through the sequence of squamous metaplasia. 20% of these patients do end up developing squamous metaplasia. Close to 50% of these people develop nipple inversion due to the inflammation, and they have non-cyclical pain. Then there's also focal tenderness due to tissue necrosis and abscess development. 
which can also then lead to rupture of an abscess and a tract lined by granulation tissue in which a fistula is developed. Here's a 39-year-old female with history of right retroareal or breast pain and a palpable mass. Here you can see that the palpable area is denoted by the BB and we've got skin thickening and increased density immediately in the retroareal or right breast. Here is just a spot compression image of that finding. On ultrasound, you can see that right below the nipple, there is this irregular, complicated, hypoechoic fluid collection. We've got peripheral increased vascularity, but we do not have any internal vascularity. Here you can see some of the movement of the fluid. This is something also when the fluid is isoechoic, it's something you do want to try to demonstrate. This patient went on to have surgical drainage and excision, and it came back with acute and chronic inflammation with no bacterial growth. Here's an extremely interesting case in which a 62-year-old female who had metastatic lung cancer and a remote history of breast cancer treated with lumpectomy presented to the ED with shortness of breath and a palpable mass in her left breast. On chest x-ray, you can see there is a deformity of the left breast shadow, and you can also see a locular fluid collection or mass within the lower left lung, and you can also identify an air fluid level superiorly. She did come to the breast imaging for ultrasound, and here in the area of her palpable finding, you can see there is a complicated fluid collection. When we actually sinned, we could see this fluid collection communicating in and out with her breathing movements with her pleural cavity. The hyperechoic areas are her ribs. Here's again just a CT, just to show you the complicated fluid collection communicating with her pleural space. So why the concern regarding proper follow-up? Well, we're all very, very nervous about missing an inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is rare and it develops rapidly. It's quoted as one to 5% of all breast cancers with a poor prognosis. The bread is red and indurated and swollen due to the tumor cells blocking the lymphatics of the skin, thus the name inflammatory breast cancer, and it can look exactly like a mastitis. It's usually associated with an unusual rapid increase in breast size. We can also describe the peau d'orange, the skin which remains tethered by the suspensory ligaments of Cooper, which then takes on a dimpled appearance. So here again is an example of the pot orange with the dimpled appearance. This is overall is pretty red, and they can rarely have flu-like symptoms, which is why it can throw us off. Patients usually complete about, complain about heaviness, tenderness. We can see nipple inversion, swollen, non-tender, and axillary lymph nodes. It can be the same presentation as mastitis, therefore there is often a delay in diagnosis, but we are trying to create a decrease in that delay if possible. Here's a 31-year-old female with a red inflamed breast. She was non-lactating. She had no history of smoking or diabetes, but she does have a positive history of breast cancer. Here is a targeted ultrasound. And we see, again, she does have some skin thickening of approximately four millimeters with not as much of subcutaneous edema as the initial patient we showed you earlier. Again, here's just a little bit of subcutaneous fluid interdigitated, again, between the breast tissue. So the report example here, probably benign diffuse skin thickening with diffuse edema is consistent with mastitis, less likely inflammatory breast cancer. Short-term follow-up in an eight-day post-treatment at a dedicated breast center was recommended to ensure symptom resolution. 
So the above findings and recommendations were discussed with the Dr. ER by the Dr. ER radiologist on date and time. This is just an example of a report that we would recommend. So the patient unfortunately came back 10 days post-treatment. After five days and having no response on antibiotics, she was changed to a different course of antibiotics. And on day 10, she came back because she had absolutely no improvement and, and significant worsening. Here you can see she's got diffuse skin thickening and increased regulation and edema throughout her entire breast. On our ultrasound, we were able to identify a irregular hypochoic suspicious mass. So this was an inflammatory breast cancer. So in summary, it's really important to identify emergent breast pathology, but also providing the appropriate recommendations. It's important to emphasize the legal importance of documenting the communication of findings and recommendations with our referring emergency department. So the take-home points is that there is significant amount of after-hours imaging of the breast, and we need to educate our colleagues on the reporting and communication of the breast patients seen in the ED. Thank you very much, and I hope you are all doing well and staying safe.